Here's Paul in Toronto on Manulife. Go ahead. Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Thanks for taking my call. I'm looking at Manulife. Uh, could you comment on the, uh, the valuation? Also, I'm taking a very long-term view on this stock. Thank you kindly. Right. Uh, so, Paul, the reason I think that you would look at Manulife is that uh, if you make the, make the case that Asia becomes very important to them because, of course, they got a big business in Asia and they're working hard to grow that. Uh, we do not own the stock, and I don't own it for a couple of reasons. I think that the sector is out of favor, and if you look at Sun Life, or you look at Great West, or you look at Manulife, and frankly, if you look at all of the major insurers in the U.S., they're underperforming the market right now. So I think that from a timing standpoint, you're challenged. Uh, there's more sellers than buyers. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is with long-term interest rates as low as they are, uh, long, the long bond has a big impact on their ability to make money. They do better when long-term interest rates are higher. So they have a challenge making the right return in their portfolio. And in the case of Manulay, some of the products that they had traditionally a lot of growth in uh, turned out uh, to uh, have not been as profitable as they would have liked, and they've carved them back out of the, out of the business. So, you know, they're trying to grow their mutual fund business, I know. I know they're working hard at growing their business in China. I think it remains to be seen if it's just that the, that the company is seen to still have challenges or whether it's the industry group. But in the short run, you know, if we were to get a rally here over the next little bit, which we think we will, I'd prefer to be in something that, that you know, really jumps when the market gets going and uh, the manual life seems uh, fairly sluggish right now. Let's talk to Mandy, who's in Vancouver. I think you're next. Go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. I was calling regarding EM Gold, or IM Gold. Right. Okay. Um, um, I purchased the stock when it was around $22, and it's gone down on to about under 18 So I just want to know how it's going to do in the next couple of months. Okay. So, uh, Mandy, I think that, you know, you're, you're working with a challenged sector right now. The sector's been out of favor. Uh, there's been a pretty good correction in the group. The one thing I will say is that seasonally, uh, summer can be a better time for the gold miners. And uh, so you could see some, some buyers come in here at sort of sitting on support uh, technically. I think that there are better places to be than the gold miners. So you could get a summer rally in, in the golds. Uh, certainly it's a popular group in Canada. Uh, but I think that um, I think you find better places to be. And you said earlier the only one you hold is Sabina. Gold. Here's Luke in Toronto as we continue this gold theme. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, David, I think you're very knowledgeable and professional. I try to watch her every time you're on, and uh, I hope one day my portfolio is big enough so I can come see you. <laughs> um, having said what you just said about gold, my question is about Barrick. Um, let me ask a more general question then. Last year, from July to December, uh, commodities as a, as a group went on a bit of a tear. Do you see that this year? And specifically about Barrick, um, if you wouldn't buy the stock right now, would you buy some options on it, maybe six to 12 right. months? So, uh, listen, I think, as, I, as we said off the top of the show, we do think that we're headed into a little bit better market here. Uh, so there's some early signs of that. And if that's the case, then you're likely to see money flow back into sort of more risk-oriented assets. Um, I just am not seeing a big uh, groundswell yet in the precious metals. So and there's a lot of chatter out there, and there's folks out you know, I think building positions, whether or not it follows through is another question. The issue with Barrick in particular, I think, is that they've made this big bet now on copper. And they're going to have to invest a lot of money uh, uh, to build out, uh, which will, means they'll take on a little bit of debt. And I think that, unfortunately, copper companies tend to trade at a different multiple than a pure gold stock. So that's the challenge that they'll have as a company. So there's a, people are looking for pure gold, maybe looking for a different type of company, you know, uh, that, that is going to give them the purer play. Um, I, I don't think you do option. If you don't want to own the stock, I don't think you want to trade an option on it. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, there, there are a few mid-caps that are acting a little better. I, you know, Sabina is quite different. It's more, you're, you're, it's a development company, and it's a much smaller cap company. Uh, I'd look at a Gold Corp probably before I'd look at a Barrick. The caller mentioned uh, coming to you as a client, potentially. What is the minimum investment with your firm? So we manage money for advisors. We run some, some funds, uh, and they have smaller minimums. Our direct business, uh, we have a $2 million minimum in our business. That's all? Uh, two million. Yeah, two okay. million. But we do run, the, do run the barometer private pools, and we run three public funds for CI under the Lakeview brand. Lakeview. Yep. All right. Uh, John's in Toronto. Go ahead, sir. 
Thanks, uh, gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, I'm planning to invest in oil stocks, and I'm thinking Baytex Energy, and I'm confused. I'm not sure if Baytex or Canadian Natural Resources. I'd like to get your opinion. Thank you. Bye. John, I have a strong opinion on that one, uh, probably because I'm speaking from a long position. We do own Baytex and have for a long time. Uh, I really like the prospects for Baytex. We have chosen to focus on uh, energy companies that either are oil or um, uh, liquid-rich gas. And actually, to take it one step further, we've focused on uh, energy companies often that pay us a yield. In the case of Baytex, their management group have done a tremendous job of finding oil. And they've got a lot of property and a lot of targets. They have enough targets that they can drill for the next five years, and management's given guidance that they think they can grow production uh, 7 to 8% a year for the next five years. So uh, let's make an assumption that they're right uh, because they've been doing a very good job of it up to this point. Um, it pays uh, over a 4% yield, just about a 5% yield. So if you think that energy prices will be more or less stable in and around these levels, you're going to get your, your 5%. You'll get a little bit of growth in the dividend. And uh, I think oil companies are ideally suited to being a cash flow paying investment. Uh, and in this case, they've been very good at it. So I, I'd rather own this than something that pays almost no dividend. David, we'll stay with energy and look at an email on Suncor from Justin in Regina. I was wondering what your thoughts are on this company. Is this a good entry point? And do you see any upside in the near future? Um, so our view on Suncor is that it's a widely held stock that has sort of disappointed folks over the last uh, couple of years, um, uh, last year or so. Um, specifically, you know, it's it's not so much a pure play on on oil or the oil sands. They got these market this marketing business that they got when they bought Petro Canada, uh, which I think is a little bit of a drag. They've had some production issues, uh, and they've got some uh, some work that they have to do on their upgrader. So I think um, from a from a production standpoint, a little bit disappointing. Uh, from a, a profitability standpoint, a little bit disappointing. Uh, and uh, a widely held stock that's disappointing people means there's lots of lots of sellers. And the last thing is, I do think there is some risk for, for oil prices. And so I would prefer to own something with a bigger yield uh, in, in the meantime. Risk for oil prices, meaning they could go We think that oil prices could go lower. Into the 80s? Yeah, it's, yeah. It, technically it looks like they could go down into the, into the low to mid 80s. Um, I'd like not to think that that's the case because it's a big part of the Canadian market. Um, uh, but it's, I think that they're, they are vulnerable right now. And uh, do you have a, uh, do you prefer uh, mid-cap, you're talking about Baytex, uh, mid-cap energy players, uh, more so than the big ones? We, we like folks that use new technologies to find greater, uh, greater reserves and uh, uh, stimulate production. So some of the mid-caps have been very, very good at that, uh, doing sort of multi-stage fracking and so on. Um, we tend to like uh, either the yield plays or ones that have something really interesting. Like I'll, I'll mention Trilogy, TET, in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, here's a, ga a company that was very good at finding gas and they were drilling for gas and lo and behold found oil. And so now they got a bunch of oil uh, and oil targets. So we know that oil companies traded a higher valuation than gas stocks do. So not only were they seen to be good at gas, but now they're gonna get a bump in valuation for their, what they're finding in oil. I like that, I think that that's, that's really great. I think that in the case of, of some of the really big uh, integrated companies, they're fighting fires on a lot of different fronts and uh, it's, it's tougher. And if you're not getting paid a yield in the meantime, you know, it's, it's tough to wait. Okay, David, we've got your uh, top picks coming up. Uh, this will be interesting. Stick around and find out what the David thinks is moving and worth investing in right now. We've got a retailer, an auto parts manufacturer, and I guess, uh, well, I guess we're looking at aerospace as well. Come back after this.